Welcome to Talks at Google. Uh, I'm very pleased today to welcome Anthony and Joe Russo, directors of the new Marvel film, Captain America Civil War. Please join me in a massive round of applause in welcoming Anthony and Joe Russo. I, um, I spent Google's money yesterday on these actual bobbleheads, so oh. um, hopefully some of that goes back to you eventually. <laughs> so, uh, sit there. Unfortunately, uh, no. I do part of that. Good. Yeah. Um, hello, uh, gents. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our um, pleasure. I will kick off by asking, can you hear me in the room if I don't use the mic? Yes. yes. Okay. We'll go that way. Uh, so, I mentioned community and arrested development at the top. I saw the movie last week. It's very good. Oh, cool. And um, what I'm intrigued in is, did you bring much from working on those very much ensemble TV shows to working on a big ensemble movie? What did you learn on a TV show? That ensemble before? work is very important. I mean, look, even in our first movie, Welcome to Collingwood, was, was also a large ensemble movie. I mean, for whatever reason, Joe and I are really drawn to ensembles. I think part of the reason is, you know, we're, like, we're film geeks. We like movies that you can... Uh, watch multiple times and kind of geek out on and, and I think one thing that ensemble storytelling gives you, it gives you a number of different access points to a story and I think you can maybe sort of choose to choose, a, choose which character you want to kind of like side with or, or access the story from and I think that's part of the fun of ensemble storytelling but I think also with our shows like Community and Arrested Development you know those shows we like to play with um, sort of ideas of genre and what your expectations of genre were and how can we subvert sort of genre expectations and storytelling and that was something that was very uh, very important to us in, in how we approached the storytelling in Civil War. But so this is an audience that hasn't seen the movie so we have to remember about yeah. So I, my questions will be free of spoilers. Okay, good. Uh, so, and how did you make sure that each character had its moment to shine? I'm interested in sort of the storyboarding process because Marvel's very much a, a, an ensemble piece. You've got Kevin Feige, who's the kind of overarching producer, then you've got the directors um, and the writers as well. So how do you work as a team to bring a movie to fruition? The process is we, um, we sit in a room with Marcus and McFeely, uh, um, uh, you know, a conference room for uh, a month or two, and we talk about what we want to accomplish with the film, what, what themes we want. And this is usually before we decide on what story we're telling. Themes that we want, uh, um, what we want to say about the characters, what characters we're interested in working with. Uh, and then once we have a story that we're happy with, and you know, Kevin comes into the room, uh, we talk it through it with him, he you know, gives his thoughts, and uh, um, particularly on this one, it was very complicated because we're adding um, uh, you know, Tony Stark as a character to the film. Uh, Robert Downey was not under contract to do the movie. Uh, it is not insignificant uh, um, to uh, bring him on board a film like this. So uh, we had to, you know, ask Kevin to, uh, to go magic work his magic on, and yeah. figure out a deal with Robert. Secondarily, once that was accomplished, I mean, I think we're incredibly greedy on this project. We then went and asked him if he could figure out how to get Spider-Man from Sony, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a unprecedented uh, deal where you're having two corporations who are competitors sharing a billion dollar piece of IP uh, uh, with each other. Uh, and that was an incredibly complicated deal that took many months. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, from a process standpoint, once we, once we agree on what we want the, uh, the, the story to be, uh, we then start layering the script with Marcus and McFeely. They, they do a draft, they come back in, and, and we very meticulously go through the, the, the script tracking each character. So we'll spend two days talking exclusively about Captain America. Then we'll spend a day talking about the Tony Stark arc, and then a day talking about Scarlet Witch, and you know, making sure that each character has some movement, no matter uh, how incremental, uh, so that they are different at the end of the movie than where they started the film. And I think very much at the end of the movie, it's fair to say uh, a number of the characters are in a very different place to where they started. And did you, I mean, were you told we need to get the characters here, or as you're planning through to Infinity Wars, you know, is that kind of, you know the journeys they're going to take. I'm intrigued with, with Ant-Man, again, don't want to spoil it, but, you know, you're playing with someone else's character. Yeah. And so how does that yeah, work? Yeah, I mean, just to yeah, demystify yeah. the process yeah. at Marvel a little bit, it's, you know, it, it's, it's wide open. You can tell whatever story you want to tell, whatever, whatever. You know, Kevin's only agenda is that the, that the stories are good stories. Uh, but there's, uh, and he's very good about, um, uh, you know, uh, each process being very hermetic. You know, the, the, it's, it's, it's a very healthy and, and humble approach, which is 
uh, if we don't make this movie the best movie that it can possibly be, then we might not get another movie. So it's not, you're, not, you're not planning too far ahead. However, uh, it is a little bit like United Artists over there right now because a lot of the other directors are very good friends of ours. And uh, we're texting each other and emailing each other constantly. And we all have a collective goal, which is to tell the best stories that we can. Uh, and uh, so there's a constant dialogue going on. And uh, Anth and I, just by nature of our relationship, are, are collaborators. That's what we have to do every day, talk things out with people. So we enjoy the, uh, the process of engaging other directors. It's what we did for years as executive producers in television, where we would uh, supervise uh, directors who would come in and work on the show. Uh, so we, engage, we, we, we enjoy that process of engagement. But it's very wide open. Uh, it's, about as, uh, it's about as healthy as a, uh, a studio experience as you can have in the business. Yeah. I think that's the secret. I think that's part of the secret to their success, frankly, is that they do. I mean, it is. You think it's, a, it's unprecedented in the sense that it's serialized storytelling, but there's a very, very big discipline about one movie at a time and letting that movie become whatever it wants to be. Yeah. So Infinity Wars 2, which I did the maths, I think is the 22nd oh, film, yeah. Some, something yeah. like that, plus wow. eight TV shows and uh, so forth. So th that isn't set in stone now. There's still a process before, we, before you get there. Oh, very much, yeah, yeah. We're just in the midst of that process now. We don't even, Marcus and McFeely are right now working on, uh, they're about to turn in the first draft okay. to us, so we're just at that oh, point. Oh, it's, it's a joint, you're filming both back to back. We are, and the re the, the, you know, we are doing both back to back, and I think that might create a little bit of a misconception that the movies are very, very different from one another. The reason why we're blocking those two movies together to shoot is because the cast is so massive. Yeah and there are so many different people involved in that movie, it just became uh, logistically and financially sensible to block work f for the actors in, in that manner. So that's, that's sort of why the, those movies are being approached that way. Great. Well, we'll open up to the floor in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about what you think about kind of digital mediums and Netflix and YouTube, and do you see those as environments to play with? I'm particularly thinking YouTube and kind of short term, short um, Well, uh, you know, yeah. I think it's changing the business. And I think if you're looking at, um, um, you know, Features, uh, um, they're under a lot of pressure at the moment. I think, you know, we've all understood storytelling uh, uh, for the last hundred years on, uh, in film as being a two hour closed ended experience. In the 80s, we introduced sequelization uh, with movies like Star Wars and Jaws and the advent of the blockbuster. Uh, and I think it's getting more and more difficult to lure people out of their homes because, one, the content is better. Uh, you know, now that TV has been freed from the shackles of the Nielsen ratings, uh, you're not trying to uh, appeal to advertisers, you're trying to appeal to uh, the audience. Uh, and the audience can be incredibly niche as long as the, you know, when you have cash rich um, companies like Netflix and Amazon, uh, um, whose valuations are, you know, many times that of studios, uh, um, you know, their, their only agenda is a cultural conversation. Uh, it's, you know, the, there is no metric really. Uh, for to gauge success, which radically changes what you can do in terms of content. As long as that content is provoke, you know, provokes a conversation, uh, it's successful. Um, and you know, features. You know, if you if to go see a movie, and I think this is why you're seeing, you know, these massive branded films. Is to go see movies. Now it costs a lot of money. You spend 100 pounds, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat. You got to get a babysitter. Uh, you know, two of you go out to the theater. Uh, dinner, popcorn, uh, you know, this, is a, this is a very expensive event uh, that is trying to compete with the media in your home. And, um, and I think technology is going to change uh, the way that we perceive content much faster than it has changed over the last hundred years, very quickly. And I think as I've got four kids myself who are all, uh, you know, aged from 19 to 10, so I've got a spread in the demographic. Uh, and just watching their viewing habits and, 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 you know, I mean, they're, a majority of the content that they view is either on YouTube or on Vine. So their, their sense of narrative is much shorter than my sense of narrative. And their ability to absorb content is much more significant than my ability to absorb content. So I, I think that is going to radically alter um, uh, how we st tell stories mov moving forward. And I think VR is going to blow everything wide open uh, uh, in the next 10 years, because I think that is an experience that uh, is next level uh, and, uh, and, and again may alter um, uh, storytelling moving forward. If you have any questions, um, I have lots of questions put in. All right, if I give you, do you want to start here? Sure. Perfect. 
I, I, I'm one of the fortunate people that has actually seen the movie, and it's fantastic. Oh, it's okay. probably the best one I've seen so far. Right, um, I just want to ask a quick question. In terms of the movie itself, um, although it's Civil War, do you ever find that as, as brothers when directing, you guys have confrontations between yourselves when directing in the direction that you want to go at one point when, when shooting? I mean, look, we've been working together for a long time, and our, our directing process has evolved over many years. I mean, we have a very... Uh, you know, we, I think maybe every directing team does it differently just in the same manner that every director works differently from another director. It's very much based on those sort of like what your personalities are and sort of you know, how you think and how you, how you create. Uh, Joe and I just have like a nonstop dialogue between ourselves. We kind of saw our way through what our vision is, how we want to achieve it, how we want to execute it, how to, how to surprise ourselves. Um, but we do, yes, it, it does often take the place of, you know, take, uh, and it, it can, can turn into arguments frequently. It's part of our process. We're very comfortable with that part of our process. I mean, one time a director friend of ours was sitting behind us at the monitors where, where we work while we're directing, and uh, he said, uh, at the end of the day, he was like, man, it was so weird sitting behind you guys because you guys, are, you guys, the conversation you have with one another is like the same conversation that I have in my head with myself when I'm directing by myself. But you know, I think any any creator, any artist, you know, goes through a process of of second guessing what they're trying to do, trying to figure out what they're trying to do, uh, liking what they're doing, not liking what they're doing. You know, it, it's you know, so we get to externalize that process between us, and uh, uh, we saw through it that way. Yeah. So, uh, Civil War is about a, a big fight between superheroes, and there's a bigger fight between a universe that's Marvel and DC Universe. So, when they announced that there will be Civil War, and then there will be Batman versus Superman, and they're going to be in the same year, and everyone was like, what, which one would be better? So, my question is, did you guys go watch Batman and Superman, and did it influence your decision during the move? Like, oh, they're doing Batman versus Superman, that should be awesome. We should make our move much more awesome. And <laughs> so did it influence any way, like, how much do other movies influence? Do you what, are you I, I fans of we're, movies? We're huge. I mean, look, we're film geeks. We we weren't the kind of guys that grew up filmmakers playing around with cameras. We grew up film nerds. Like we grew up around this corner from a cinema tech, and we geeked out on foreign films and art house films and every kind of film that was sort of our thing. So yes, we are fans. We've been fans our lives of the com comic genre and other genres. But no, I think that that we might have a little bit of a disappointing answer for you in the sense that. Look, we, we sort of developed our instincts about where we wanted to go on this story, telling this story, just thinking about where we were and where we had taken the character in, in Winter Soldier, where Captain America was. There were specific narrative reasons that led us to Civil War that we can go into later. But um, the other thing that is that we're not really aware, you know, yes, Bat, you know, that Batman versus Superman was being developed, but. That's at another company. There's no, there's no overlap between these companies. We basically have no idea what they're doing with the idea, how they're shaping it, how they're executing it. They have no idea how we're shaping it. You know, there's just no connection between the two projects. And I'm sure they were following their instincts on what they thought they should do. We were simply following our instincts on what we wanted to do. We, we were very much thinking about how do we follow up Winter Soldier and what's the right timing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe for a story. That's how we arrived at the issue of Civil War. We felt that it was the right time. We watched these characters now develop into a bit of a surrogate family with one another over the course of several films. And they have a very specific purpose, very specific abilities that bond them together, and very thick relationships that they develop. We felt it was time for a family fight. And that's why we, we gravitated to Civil War. So, Thank you. Yeah. So Civil War is a book as well, right? And it's a great book. Now, there are many movies like that, like Watchmen, for example, that they changed quite significantly the ending of the movie and stuff like that. So how much freedom freedom do you have to change the plot of the book? To, because I guess many of the viewers, the audience, will have read the book, right? So they yeah. will expect something. Yeah, we have the ultimate freedom to change whatever we want. And I think, um, you know, I'm a comic book fan. I started collecting when I was 10 years old. Uh, as a comic book fan, I'm not particularly interested in going to the theater and seeing uh, a literal adaptation of a book. I already read the book. So, you know, in what, what, what manner or capacity am I going to be surprised by the storytelling? Uh, we are working in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, which is not the publishing side of things, uh, and uh, a very different medium. Uh, we have two hours to tell stories. They have, you know, months and months, sometimes years. 
uh, multiple issues, multiple uh, writers, uh, you know, offshoots, you know, crossovers. Um, so for us, we just take the concept of the book, uh, especially in the Civil War case, we take the idea behind it, which is that, uh, you know, that, that the Avengers need to be regulated by a government authority. Uh, uh, but we take that idea and we apply it to where these characters are now in the Marvel Cinematic Universe so that we can exploit our storytelling. Um, so, you know, we definitely owe a debt to the book in that regard, but um, we're also very careful to not uh, uh, tell the story in a way that you're, you, you know you could predict had you read the book what's going to happen in the movie. I like the word you use the word family. Like it did feel like a family film. I, I lots of people clamoring for crossovers with the TV show and the Netflix and so forth. But for me, it didn't feel like that was the right place to happen. It was just that those characters knowing each other and fighting felt like the right. It's a surrogate family. And yeah. Both Cap and Tony are patriarchal figures in very different ways. You know, uh, and their their personality types. Uh, are that you know there's a there's a there's a polarity um, um, cap is a uh, you know uh, a really morally centered uh, um, a strong uh, uh, individual who you know you could say his flaws that he's stubborn uh, to a fault uh, and uh, and Tony is um, you know is this uh, warring uh, you know inside him there's a war going on between his narcissism and his uh, desire to help humanity and do good. Um, uh, so I think, you know, with th what was interesting about Civil War was both characters had, had alternately uh, been illustrated as patriarchal in this family called the Avengers, and what would happen if these, uh, these two patriarchal figures got mad at each other and, uh, and chose different sides on a very critical issue that was threatening to f push the family apart. And that's really what the movie's about. Question on this side. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm going to assume Stan Lee's got a cameo in this. <laughs> so I was going to ask, what's it like working with Stan Lee? Because when you come into it, you know, he's like the big daddy, isn't it? So does he have any kind of input, or does he just pull you aside and say, just make sure you do this and that? Uh, what's working with Stan Lee like? Here, the best way to describe it is I, I just like to tell our, our first experience with Stan Lee. So we're shooting The Winter Soldier, and we're getting ready to... Uh, you know, we're gonna, it's the day where we're going to shoot his uh, scene, his cameo scene, which is, I don't know if you remember or you saw that movie, he's working as a night watchman at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. when someone breaks in in the middle of the night and steals Cap's World War II uniform. And, stuff. and so, he's, you know, we come in and he's, uh, so we set the scene up. It's a very simple shot. It's just him walking through the museum with a flashlight. He notices the missing thing and he has a funny line. So we've never met him before. Uh, he's coming from, we're in sh Cleveland shooting, he's coming in straight from the airport, and all of a sudden it's very important that everything be ready to go the second he walks on set. So he, we, we get the shot set up, we know, we know everyone knows what they're doing, he walks on set, he's like, how you doing, how you doing? He shakes everyone's hands real quick, talking, boom, he gets right on the mark, we call action, he walks the scene about three or four or five times, We've got it. Okay, all right, I'll see you. Bye, 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 bye. And you guys are fantastic. Bye, bye, bye. And then boom, boom he's gone. That's Stanley. That's, that's pretty much the experience of Stanley. So, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, question at the back. Yeah. Uh, you said directed Winter Soldier, which uh, was a super successful movie, and so much that uh, on this period of action, he thought it was super entertaining, and I had no no qualms with it whatsoever, which is impressive. <laughs> so how was how was building up to that and do another another Captain America thing? How was the pressure on that? Well, it's interesting. You look. There certainly can be a lot of pressure if you allow it, uh, because the fan base is quite large, quite passionate, and very vocal. Uh, but they also speak with really disparate voices. Everybody wants something different from the movies. Um, so. If you try to listen to the public, you're going to wind up making a mess of a film. Uh, we learned very early on in our careers that um, we always did our best work uh, when we were trying to make work that pleased us. And then we would hope that uh, everybody else uh, uh, um, enjoyed, enjoyed it as well. Uh, and we always did our worst work when we tried to anticipate what the audience wanted. Um, and also, you, you just when you do that, you don't sweet, sleep as well at night. So, um, you know. With a movie like this, I think because there are two of us, we have a very zen approach to the filmmaking, which is, look at, you know, uh, we've been hired to do this job. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to go out there and make a movie that we're proud of and we're happy with. And this was not an easy movie to make uh, from a, um, 
you know, uh, um, it, it was a complicated film. There's a, it's, it's very subversive in tone. The third act is um, unpredictable and, uh, and has, you know, very dark elements to it. Uh, and, uh, and it created a, a, a real fight inside Marvel. So this was from willing the movie into existence, willing Robert into the film, willing Spider-Man into the movie. It was Herculean in, in scale, but ultimately those were the things that we wanted to tell the story that we wanted to tell. Uh, and, uh, and, and we knew that, you know, um, just from a, a you know, personal integrity standpoint, that if we fought to win those things and we won, uh, that when the movie came out, that, you know, again, we would just feel better about the work that we did and sleep better at night. So that's ultimately our goal uh, is to just please ourselves and, and you need to keep your fingers crossed that it translates to an audience. Great. Let's take one from over here. Yeah. Hi. Um, I've seen a lot of gag reels from the Marvel movies and it seems like they're all, they all like to goof around and have fun and wanted to know how hard it is to work with them when they like to mess around that much. It doesn't feel like kindergarten or how hard is working with the talent? Well, every time I see one of those gag reels, like our editor just showed us uh, the one we're going to use for, for, for the DVD, it's like, I'm always surprised. Like, I'm like, my God, there's so vulgarity laid in this. Like, it's like crazy. And, and uh, every other gag involves Anthony Mack. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, look, it's very interesting. There are a number of ways, you know, Joe and I worked in comedy for years. So we like to create a set. We love improvisational performers. We like to create an environment on set where people feel very open to express themselves and to be experimental and to be, be surprising, and, but also feel well supported and well connected to everybody else. It's the environment we try to create among our crew as well. We really love, like Joe was saying earlier, we love the pro process of collaboration. So we try to create like a family-like environment on set where everybody feels very welcome and invited to contribute in every way they can. That's, that's what we feed off of. But yeah, some, you know, and some, some actors have very different processes. Some people like to be uh, very focused and quiet, and they sort of like are, are that Chadwick Boseman, for instance, is very much like that. He's a very, very much a method actor. He plays Black Panther in this movie. Um, he, you know, he's, he's an American actor, but he did a very, very specific African accent for the character, and he would stay in accent uh, the entire time we were shooting. He would never speak in his in normal voice. So he, here's a guy who's kind of keeping in character, keeps pretty quiet, you know, between takes, doesn't really socialize much, pleasant, you know, friendly, but, but very quiet. And then there's other people like Anthony Mackie, like Joe was just talking about, who, you know, the second Anthony Mackie gets on set, it's like he's doing a stand-up routine for, for everybody involved in the, in the production, you know, which is very entertaining. It really helps the energy flow. But you have a, you know, you have a wide disparity of like how people like to work. And Joe and I, again, as directors, you try to create an environment where everybody feels comfortable and welcome to work in the way they, they can. Sometimes it's hard to balance, but I think over time we've developed a sense of how to keep things balanced. So. We've got time for one more question. So someone's got the mic over here. Or over here. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm Eguro. Um, I guess we're very passionate about technology and sometimes overly passionate, and I'm guessing in the film industry, um, between the, the brothers, you know, you, you, you might have very opposing views at a certain take. How do you kind of resolve those kind of conflict? Thumb war. Thumb war. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what, it's really, uh, it's really just, we just argue the concept out uh, and whoever has a better argument wins. Um, it's usually, that's I think how we try to, you talked about honest trailers earlier, it's how we try to logic proof the work that we're doing is we argue through every story point. Now, you know, different movies have different requirements. So, you know, uh, Winter Soldier is a political thriller, which is a plot-based film. Uh, the, the concept behind political thriller is that the, the lead character is, uh, is uh, not caught up with the events that are actually occurring in the storytelling. They're behind the events. Uh, and typically by the end of the second act, they catch up with the plot of the movie, uh, at which point they can then engage the villain and defeat the villain in the third act. Civil War is very different because it's a, it's a psychological thriller uh, that turns on the character choices that the characters make. Uh, uh, and it's all leading towards a very cathartic uh, uh, moment. Um, uh, so, you know, for us, it's, uh, uh, the priorities are different. Like in, in, in Ca and, uh, Winter Soldier, plot is a priority. So all the work that we put into arguing about our, our, our process had to do with the plot and, and trying to airtight the plot as much as possible. Uh, Civil War is character-driven, and the, cho you know, the choices and the, 
the, the moments of the movie turning on character. So a lot of our time and energy is spent arguing about the characters and the choices that they're making and do we have fidelity to the characters? Is there proper motivation for the characters? And frankly in this movie, you know, plot is a secondary, uh, secondary issue. Yeah, but I think um, also, you know, I think there's a lot of different types of directing teams and, but there, it is striking how there seems to be a, an uncommonly high percentage that, that are siblings, right? among directing teams and I think that you know there, there is a uniqueness in that relationship and that you do get to difficult parts in the process where you have a difference of opinion and it's not something you can necessarily logic through or, or arrive at some sort of objective answer it just boils down to like who is more passionate about their point of view at that given moment if you have to choose go down road A or road B and I think that you know maybe with siblings you have a, you have that ability to like submit your ego at times because you, you, you have that conditioning of growing up in a family together where you had to operate as a unit you know for part of your life so you have that default you can go back to and I think it, it helps in the creative process to to give us a flexibility with one another perhaps you know. well thank you so much for joining us today you're gonna go sure. ready for the premiere that's right yes, yes. we yeah. are yeah very so, excited for um, that. brilliant uh, yeah. so please join me in a massive round of applause thanking Anthony and Joe